Despite all this networking, there was no simple way for CERN scientists to retrieve information from each other's computers. In fact, it was exactly like the Internet on a small scale. It was basically technically trivial to go and get it. It just happened that you had to be a guru of the highest degree to actually be able to navigate all the networks and figure out all the programs that you would come across on your way and, uh, and know, the, uh, you know uh, what commands to give them to actually get the data back. And the chances are when you got it back, you wouldn't be able to actually uh, read it anyway because of all the incompatibilities. I started in October writing a, a program called, which I call World Wide Web. You're reading something, you could, if it's interesting and you've got right access to it, you could just highlight a phrase, hit a hotkey, control, shift, N, and it would bring up a, another window. Tim Berners-Lee's greatest achievement may have been giving an address to every bit of information on the Internet. You've seen these things. www.cringely.com. That's my web page, and this is the address called a Universal Resource Locator. Forget about that. The important thing is that you don't have to know about names of files. You don't have to know where this is. You just have to remember cringely.com, and you're there. The power of a hypertext link is that it can link to absolutely anything. That's the fundamental concept. The fundamental idea was anything which was out there somewhere sitting on a computer disk where that computer was attached to a network, you ought to be able to give it an address. You ought to be able to make a link to it. The uh, key insight that I think I credit Tim Berners-Lee with is the URL, the idea that there's a uniform r resource locator that says I can point at any particular bit of information on the Internet. If I mean that you should go to this, this university, look in their FTP archive, look in their file archives, and download this picture of a Corvette and put it up on the screen, I now have a way of doing that. So that's why the characters HTTP backslash www have become as familiar as Coca-Cola. Tim's solution for the world's particle physicists turned out to be a solution for everyone, helping to network incompatible computers. CERN wasn't in the internet business, but in 1991, they published the code and within four years, the World Wide Web was sending more packets than any other internet service. They took the bit, bits and pieces that existed and figured out a way to put them together uh, and make it work. Uh, it was a tour de force. The people who did the World Wide Web were really willing to take uh, existing pieces of things in god-awful condition in some cases and figure out a way to make it work. And the World Wide Web people deserve a lot of credit for what they did. I mean, what they did was very difficult. <laughs> The web is a success precisely because it is not a monolithic new software product. You don't get web 9.0 in the mail on CD-ROM. The web is a collection of a whole bunch of small technologies that fit together because a, you know, a couple dozen people all thought about how they'd work together cool. And they're all being evolved constantly in real time by thousands of people around the world. And there isn't any central release. You can't go anywhere to go buy a copy of the web. The fact that the World Wide Web did work I find it's not just exciting for itself, but exciting for the whole idea that you can have an idea, you know, some idea and it can take off and it can happen. Uh, it means that sort of dreamers all over the world <laughs> should take heart and not stop. The web was a huge step toward wiring the world, but more changes were to come. One of these happened far from CERN and far from Silicon Valley, too. It happened here. U.S. government money made possible the ARPANET and the Internet, but there was a catch. There was no commerce allowed on the net. When this restriction was finally lifted, it wasn't Bill Gates or any of the other digital titans who turned the Internet into a commercial marketplace. No, it was the folks on the hill, the custodians of capitalism. It was Uncle Sam. Roll the drums and sound the trumpets for the congressman from Virginia's fighting ninth district, the Honorable Rick Boucher, who in 1992 amended a law. Here are the historic words which made all the difference. This future ubiquitous network for voice, video, and data communications of all kinds will connect homes, schools, and workplaces. It will constitute an essential ingredient for our future economic competitiveness and will open new worlds of information and services for all of the nation's citizens. This is Congress speak for you may now buy and sell things on the net. What made it easy to do so was one more software breakthrough. It was not at Stanford, but on a Midwestern campus that the second great innovation of 90s internet technology took place. Here, a bright kid named Mark Andreessen was earning minimum wage at nights 
writing code in a supercomputer center at the University of Illinois. His prototype browser was a piece of software called Mosaic. We ended up sort of in the middle of the night starting this project that we called Mosaic. What we were trying to do was just put sort of a human face on the internet. The internet at that point was a tool for researchers and scientists. For years, Bill Joy had been telling me that someday we'd back a 21-year-old kid who would write software that would change the world. And lo and behold, sitting in my office is this 23-year-old, not a kid, I mean, he's a very mature, hulking, <laughs> uh, young executive. And uh, Mark said this software is going to change everything. For me, this whole thing started exploding with the invention of the browser, you know, Mosaic, because suddenly the internet was accessible to the average person through this rich graphical interface. You didn't have to know these arcane protocols. You didn't have to be a nerd anymore to access the internet. Mosaic put a face to the web, and Mosaic plus the web then finally gave us a way to express to the non-technical person what all of us in computing knew was the tremendous value of having networks interconnected. And now everyone's a webhead and everyone's excited about the web. Those ideas have been present for 20 years, but it took a killer application, clearly Mosaic. Mark's Mosaic browser spread across the internet like wildfire. Oddly enough, Microsoft wanted to be the Microsoft of the online market too. But for a change, Microsoft didn't succeed. The Microsoft network was our uh, decision to get into the online service business. Uh, we thought that for people at home in particular, this would be explosive. And we, we very much uh, believe that to this day. Uh, electronic mail, staying in touch with your friends, seeing what's going on in the local community, getting up to date news, uh, and having that be nicely packaged with chat sessions and neat new software features. We saw a market for that. Two things are constant in Silicon Valley, the steady consumption of soda and change. Excite's original product was just a search engine. Now they've built a business around it. They changed the company name. The offices changed from grungy to glitzy. And in 1995, they became that web phenomenon, an internet media site. A cross between an electronic newspaper and a cable network funded by advertising. We call ourselves publishing on steroids. So devoid of print, paper, and ink, we do what a publisher does or a cable provider does. We aggregate consumers around our programming, and then we sell that demographic back to advertisers. The different ways to make money in the internet are just beginning to emerge. For Excite, the model is a media channel with content to attract me and advertising to catch my eye while I'm there. But there are other ways. Pay-per-view, mail-order shopping of every kind, games, auctions, and services with no earthly parallel. They're all putting their faith in a new medium to deliver the big payoff. In 1999, online advertising revenue will reach $2 billion, and it's been doubling each year. How about advertising? Well, people say, what a puny number. The software industry only had $300 million in advertising for that internet supported internet companies that were supported by advertising. Well, I say, like, yo, a year before that we had zero. Now we had 300. This March we had 57 million. Who thought we would own advertising? In 1995, there were 27,000 commercial websites. In 1998, three quarters of a million. 30 times as many. Mail order is becoming email order, and you don't have to dress up to go shopping. In fact, you don't have to dress at all. In terms of infrastructure costs, buying underwear in your underwear is hard to beat. And if you buy the same underwear, you know exactly what the product is. You don't have to look at it. You, you buy Munsing wear 34s or whatever, you know, kangaroo pouch, you know, you know, 12 pair. Please mail it to my house. There's this very American temptation to use the internet to sell things. But what to sell? Well, everyone on the net can already read and write. So the first big commercial success is using digital technology to push that most analog of products, the printed word. But this is not Gutenberg being replaced by the World Wide Web. It's Gutenberg enhanced, using modern technology to sell books. Lots and lots of books.